So there I was doing some minor maintenance on my car door and I suddenly had visions of losing all my fingers in a freak accident, the kind involving my wife. And this got me thinking, what's the most you can have amputated and survive? Jumping onto Google shortly after and quickly finding myself on Wikipedia, where else? I found our word of the day, hemicorporectomy. I love every kind of word from small words like bug to big words like hemicorporectomy. Oh yeah. <laughs> hemicorporectomy? I don't know that word. I'm curious. What does it mean? Oh, well. A hemicorporectomy is, and I quote, a radical surgery in which the body below the waist is amputated, transecting the lumbar spine. This surgery removes the legs, the genitalia, both internal and external, the pelvic bones, the urinary system, the anus, and the rectum. Now, clearly you're not waking up one morning and going, gee, I feel like having a hemicorporectomy. The extreme surgery is performed as a last resort in cases where patients are suffering from major bone infections or bone cancers in the lower half of their body, obviously, or in the event of extreme horrifying traumas. And it has also been performed on people who are already in wheelchairs or already bed bound, who are experiencing repeated life-threatening infections from bed sores, also known as pressure sores. Beyond this controlled surgical hemicorporectomy, there is also what is called a traumatic hemicorporectomy. This is the kind that normally involves heavy machinery <laughs> or things like trains hitting people. Um, normally accidental, but obviously murder can be involved as well. The first thing that popped into my mind when I thought about traumatic hemicorporectomy is, and I don't know why, but the movie Signs, where, spoiler alert, M. Night Shyamalan crashes his car into Mel Gibson's wife, pinning her against a tree and effectively cutting her in half. A scene they parody in Scary Movie 3 which may help you to understand what I'm talking about a little bit better. I, I still don't get it. This is your wife. She broke her wiener. As you might imagine, people experiencing this kind of uh, accidental downsizing don't uh, tend to live very long. They die from extreme blood loss and shock and just the pure trauma of the event. According to the Wikipedia page, in fact, nobody has survived a true traumatic hemicorporectomy that is actually being cut in half uh, for more than a few hours. It's such an extreme event, in fact, that many medical guidelines consider a traumatic hemicorporectomy like automatically fatal. This NHS guideline for resuscitation, for example, describes a traumatic hemicorporectomy as, quote, unequivocally associated with death. Included in the list of things that are unequivocally associated with death, decapitation, massive cranial destruction, i.e. your head being exploded, and rigor mortis, as in a corpse that's stiff. At first I was like, oh my god, they're gonna leave you to die if they find you cut in half, that's terrible. I mean, why wouldn't they give you any help? But then I stopped being a complete idiot, and I used my mind tools and read the document. And what this all means is that if you've been cut in half, and the paramedics find you, and check your pulse and you don't have one, they're probably not going to attempt to resuscitate you. You're dead. There's nothing they can do to help you. Which seems reasonable in the same way, I suppose, that you wouldn't expect anyone to try to resuscitate a rotting corpse or a decapitated head. Anyway, so my question was, how much of your body can you lose and survive? And the answer is, if you have a planned amputation in a pretty advanced medical facility, you can lose the lower half of your body at about the belly button, as long as the good organs are kept intact and survive, apparently for decades. That was a quick one. Thanks for watching. Right at the beginning of my knowledge quest, I noticed this line, quote, Till 2009, 66 cases have been reported in medical literature. The most recent documented operation was in 2019. In trying to find out what happened in that particular case, I went down another rabbit hole. And here's what I found. On September 27th, 2019, a guy named Lawrence Showers, who was about 19 years old, was working on a road and bridge construction site in the middle of nowhere, AKA rural Montana. At some point before the accident occurred, a car had struck a safety barrier and to cover myself, I'm gonna say allegedly, Lauren was instructed to move it using a forklift by his foreman. 
This was despite the fact that he didn't have a license or much experience operating a forklift. Pretty heavy piece of machinery, some things you need to learn. So anyway, he drives this forklift out onto the partially completed bridge, and as he is crossing, another car comes speeding down the road towards him. In an attempt to avoid a collision, Lawrence swerved out of the way, and in so doing moved his forklift onto the uncompacted dirt on the side of the construction site. This dirt under the weight of the forklift gave way, and the vehicle began to topple over. Lauren, being inexperienced, panicked, and he jumped from the forklift. Standard procedure would be, I believe, to stay in the forklift. That's where you sa you're safest, they can dig you out if there's any problem later on. Unfortunately, his leg became tangled in the safety belts, and Lauren, who is now outside the vehicle, along with the forklift, tumbled down the embankment. When the forklift finally came to a halt, Lauren was pinned at the waist underneath it. Lauren is conscious as the dust now settles, and he begins to look around, he's pinned, uh, fortunately, he's not feeling much pain because when he looks at his right arm, it's been totally mangled, broken. He says it's uh, like a piece of meat hanging there. He's also experiencing uh, trouble breathing. His ribs have been broken and pinned underneath this very heavy forklift, three tons or something, is his body. And he doesn't know it yet, but almost everything below his waist has been shattered. Clearly a severe situation. A medical helicopter was called and paramedics arrived relatively quickly remember they're in the middle of nowhere though they immediately began stabilizing him and set about extricating him and preparing him for evacuation to a trauma unit within a few hours he was airlifted to bozeman montana where doctors tried their best but were unable to restore blood flow to his shattered legs it became clear that his injuries were far beyond their capabilities so lauren now sedated was prepared for a mercy flight to the far more advanced harborview medical center in seattle washington this is a world-class facility and fun fact, it's the hospital that Grey's Anatomy is based on. But even the skilled doctor models at the Grey's Anatomy Hospital found it difficult to repair the extensive damage. As the hours stretched into days, necrosis was clearly setting in and the stress on his organs was taking its toll. His kidneys were on the verge of shutting down. With no other options, the decision was made to amputate his left leg at the hip, his right leg above the knee, and his right arm at the elbow. It's pretty extreme in of itself, but it was deemed necessary because of the extent of his injuries and it was hoped that if they were able to remove these dead pieces of his body, the rest of the remaining tissue would have a better chance of surviving. Unfortunately, the amputations and efforts to restore blood to the pelvis hadn't been enough. What remained of his lower body was simply too mashed up. By this stage, his family had completed the journey to Seattle to be with him. During a consultation, the doctors presented Lauren's mother, his medical proxy, with the stark choice of a hemicorporectomy, with all the associated risks for her teen son's future, and basically allowing nature to take its course, which, you know, almost certainly would result in his death. Now, geez, making these decisions for a loved one must be mind-blowingly difficult in an ideal situation, one where you've had time to discuss things with them thoroughly. And yeah, I'm sure that, you know, many mothers haven't had the what should I do if you've been crushed and you're in a coma and we need to cut you in half talk with her teenage sons? The hell that his mother must have been going through along with his family, I, I can't even begin to imagine it. Going backwards and forwards, you know, the doctors are saying we got to do this. The mother's like, I don't know what to do. Uh, Lauren's sister spoke up and said, guys, we need to let Lauren make this decision. And so the doctors agreed. They believed they could do it with limited you know, risk to him, bring him out of sedation and put this in crazy choice to, to the young man. After waking him up and allowing the drugs to clear a bit, they then presented him with the situation and you know what his choices were, all the challenges that were associated with it, which unfortunately also included not being able to have children. Lauren responded by saying that he wanted to live. And I quote, I don't care if I'm just a head on a plate. I want to live. Now that they had Lauren's consent and he displayed his clear will to live, they began preparing for the major operation that lay ahead. Now, not to diss any other hemicorporectomies, but Lauren's one was pretty hardcore. The guy was literally dying. Every passing minute was making him weaker. So the doctors had to plan and execute the enormously complicated surgery in a matter of days where, you know, they might otherwise have had weeks or months. Lauren's traumatic injuries also made it unclear how much tissue was actually salvageable. And while his vital organs were obviously a concern, doctors had to pay close attention to his abdominal muscles and skin as well. 
Both had been badly mutilated, but would be vital in the upcoming surgery. Essentially, this flesh from the front of his body would be wrapped underneath him and around his organs and sewn to what was left of his back to create a seal. The doctors decided to go for the bare minimum of flesh, as this reduced the risk of keeping dead or dying tissue that could, could cause complications later on. But this choice meant that if their calculations were off even a little, there just wouldn't be enough to close the wound. They also decided that the surgery should be broken up into two phases. The first would be a salvage phase, where the dead tissue was removed, effectively the hemicorporectomy itself. The second phase would be the closure. Phase one took hours, but was completed successfully. But what makes this so insane, at least to me, they didn't immediately move on to closing him up. They didn't go to phase two straight away. They paused to give his body time to rest, and I would imagine give them a breather and some time to observe and plan. Apparently everything was like bagged and covered up and put, you know, put things on to keep it moist and functioning and prevent infection. But for all intents and purposes, his organs were just like splayed, spilled out on the bed where his legs would have been. And the waiting went on for about two days before it was clear that what remained was in fact viable. And then his organs, I'm talking liver, stomach, intestines, kidneys, were removed from the plastic wrapping and carefully placed back in his body cavity. The abdominal wall was then wrapped around them, creating a seal and stitched to his back. Happily, the second phase was completed successfully, and after fighting off an infection and surviving near kidney failure, Lauren's condition began to stabilize to the point that he was entering rehabilitation in the first quarter of 2020. He's a tough, tough kid, and obviously modern medicine, ama amazing. Now, it goes without saying that Lauren faces many challenges, both large and small, physical and mental. You know, I don't want to steal too much of his story, so I'm just going to focus on two that were like mind-blowing to me. One, without a lower half of his body, he lacks the mechanisms to manage waste, something that most of us literally do without thinking. Uh, he, he has no bladder to collect urine. He has no, most of his lower bowel is removed. So what happens? To collect the urine, he basically has needles <laughs> inserted directly into his kidneys through his back, which are connected to tubes that lead to bags into which the urine drains as it's created. Uh, I had known obviously about a catheter which collects from the bladder, but I'd never heard of this. It's, it's called a nephrostomy apparently. But like any foreign body being inserted into you for an extended amount of time, the nephrostomy has increased risk of serious complications, including infection. And can you imagine if it's knocked or something or it's improperly maintained, the bleeding or the, uh, oh, yeah. <clears throat> he also has a colostomy bag for co the collection of feces. This I had heard of, I've actually seen it. But for those who don't know, this is basically an opening in the abdomen. What's left of the lower bowel is attached to the abdomen. There's a hole and the poop just flows into the bag. Well, to my mind, you know, it's a little bit less extreme than a nephrostomy, mainly because I fucking hate needles. It also presents dangers, you know, of infection and trauma. And the maintenance of these two realities, these two challenges must be a substantial daily battle. Worse though, if you can imagine it, is number two, which is the phantom limb syndrome that Lauren experiences regularly. This is a wild situation where your brain receives information from nerves that lead it to believe that it is still feeling a missing limb. These sensations apparently are fairly common in amputees, but many of the people who experience the, the, the feeling of a phantom limb also feel pain from that phantom limb. And Lauren, unfortunately, is one of these people. He has to deal with debilitating bouts of agony that can last for hours and apparently even days. Currently, there is no surefire way to relieve this pain beyond medication. And obviously that's just short term, it doesn't solve the underlying problem. There are a few tricks that you can perform on the brain, as we see here in this video that I've snicked from his main page. He's uh, having pressure applied to his back and he's being asked to imagine unclenching the, the missing muscles. And apparently this does offer some pain relief. But again, this only works some of the time, only works partially, and Lauren does have to resort to pain medicine. But he has expressed hesitation in using pain medicine, you know, because he's wary of addiction. And obviously there's long-term health implications of using strong opioids for, you know, sustained amounts of time. While there are undoubtedly many, many other challenges, and lots of other things that cause pain. I'm happy to report that there is a lot of positive news too. Doctors initially believed that Lauren would be stuck in a bed for the rest of his life, as they believed a prosthesis in his case would be impossible. But happily, this proved to be incorrect and a bucket was created for him. Essentially, this is a, a full body prosthesis that supports his body weight and protects his organs. 
Receiving one of these allows him to sit upright, which allows him to use a wheelchair for an extended amount of time, which means that he's mobile, which means that he can get around the house and he can go outside and live his life the best he can. With the help of rehabilitation and training, he's also learned to you know, do a lot for himself. He still has one arm, which is able to pull him up. He can get into the bucket. He's able to dress and groom himself. He can get into and out of the wheelchair. He can cook and clean. He can enjoy the outdoors. Despite this amazing degree of independence, he will still require lifelong support, which again, happily, he has received from his community, his family, his well wishes around the world, and his amazing girlfriend, Sabia. With all the support, he continues his recovery and adaptation. And this is even in spite of the COVID-19 pandemic, which, you know, was a serious threat to someone in Lauren's condition. And while things will never really be the same, he started to build a, a new future. He and Sabia were engaged last year, and I'm happy to report they were married at the end of February 2021. And I think I'll leave things there on that happy note. Uh, but I want to encourage you to keep following Lauren's story in detail and in his own words on the couple's YouTube channel and on Instagram and on TikTok. Do check them out. They're definitely worth watching. These videos are incredible. And each view obviously will help these guys out with monetization and exposure. They've also set up a store and a PayPal link and a GoFundMe page. Consider supporting them directly if you can. I've put the links in the description below. They're open and honest and amazingly positive. And yeah, I don't want to get too soppy, but like I'm in awe of them. I'm not sure that I could be as positive and happy, you know, not all the time, but like at all, if I was in either of their shoes. So it's just, it's an amazing story. They seem like amazing people. Before I finally end off, if you woke up in hospital in a similar position to Lauren, what would you decide? Now, I'd like to think I'd make the same choice, that I'd be brave, embrace life. But yeah, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure that I could do it, hey? Let me know what you would do in the comments below. If I got anything wrong, please, please let me know. I hate getting things wrong. And yeah, thanks for watching.